Hi there! In this video we're going to be restoring and refinishing this 1964 Fender Mustang. Uh, so the story behind this guitar is that it was imported from America uh, in the very early 2000s, I think around 2000, 2001, something like that. Um, and then the owner of it has been sitting with it ever since with the intention of getting it restored uh, but has never got around to it until we just recently in this year. And this is the finished result. Uh, so I'm going to take you through the process and show you how we got to this stage here. So here it is. So it's a really nice example and completely original. Uh, so I've got all the original parts on here. And this is the condition it arrived to me in. Uh, so all the parts are actually already detached, which saves me having to do it. And the finish has been stripped a long, long time ago um, by someone else. So you can see all the pots original on the plate. So that's really cool. All this parts from all that time ago. And then we've got the pit guard here, which is all original as well. And you can see there's a date on there of 64. And the only thing I'm not sure is original is this switch here, just because it's uh, a lot shinier than this one and it's a different make as well. So this might have been replaced at some point, possibly. Uh, but otherwise, I think everything else is original. It's got all the shielding plates in here, which I'm actually going to leave in place when I'm doing the work. So I'm just going to take them off so they don't get all covered in paint. Uh, you can see the original colour down there as well, and in the cavities. So that's the Daphne blue, which is the same colour we're going to paint it in to bring it back to its uh, original condition. Uh, so there's quite a few little marks on it. Uh, you can see that that's probably one of the worst ones, it's quite deep. And around the edges there's a few where you can see the original primer and colour in there. And some of those dents. Uh, so there is going to be some filling required. I don't want to sand it too much because I don't want to lose any of the original contours or originality. So there will be some filling required. Uh, you can see on the back there's actually a couple of marks. Uh, which have been filled already at some point. It looks like actually possibly original, they look very old. And I think I read somewhere about these being the pin router marks, which is when they put it on the jig at the factory. So these were actually drilled intentionally and then filled afterwards. That's what they could be, I believe. Yeah, the neck is in excellent condition. So it's got all the original finish. And there's hardly any marks on that. So we're not doing anything to the neck. We're just going to take it off and put it to one side. And you can see this has got a lovely Brazilian rosewood fretboard, which you can't get these days because it's nearly extinct. But back then it meant nothing really. Yeah, there's plenty of it. And you can see it's got the original tuners and all the decal there. So thankfully a lot of the stripping work's already done. Uh, so we can just take the neck off and get started prepping it for finish. Uh, so the first step will be sanding and uh, getting these dents out or filling them. Uh, so that's what we're going to do now. So I got the neck off. I'm uh, just having a look at the frets because I, I remember the customer mentioned he might need a fret job on it. And you can see there's a little bit of wear on this first and a little bit on the second fret. And obviously the fretboard's quite dirty as well, so other than a, maybe a fret level and a clean, that's all we're going to do to the neck, hopefully. Uh, certainly no finished stuff, because uh, it looks great. So the guitar actually came with its original hard case too, which is nice. Uh, so I've just actually just stashed all these parts and the neck in there for safekeeping, and we're going to come back to them when we need them. So I've actually just noticed a little repair which needs to be done, uh, which I don't think the customer or myself was aware about. Uh, so there's a little crack which is running from this bridge stud hole here. Uh, it's not too bad, it doesn't go run all the way or anything like that, but you can see it's flaked onto this side. So it goes from this bridge stud down there and it goes into this tremolo cavity there. Uh, so this is going to be a very simple fix. I'm just going to need to inject some glue into it and then fortunately I can get, actually get a clamp in here. So this will go just like that. And then I'll be able to clamp it in there. Uh, fortunately, it's got no finish on yet, so it's a good time. Good job I noticed it now, rather than when it had finish on, because then we'll have to worry about keeping the finish nice while we're clamping it. So that's only a hairline crack, uh, rather than trying to get wood glue in there, which I don't think would penetrate very well. I'm going to use water thin super glue. It might make a little bit of a mess on the top here, but it's all got to be sanded anyway, so I'm not too worried about it. So I'm just going to got a little pipette thing on the end of it, and I'm just going to flow it onto the top of it. Um, capillary action will take it down. Where it needs to go. I'm going to get it clamped as quick as I can before the glue sets. 
so that should stop that getting any worse. Um, happy with how that's come out. It's uh, got lots of squeeze out when I clamped it up. Uh, so lots of the glue got into where it needed to be. And it's all flush again now. The little flake which was sticking up has now gone down. And it's got right down the crack as well. It didn't actually extend on this side. It might look like it does, but that's just a scratch in the wood here. Uh, which is, was obviously done when they removed the bushing here. So I'm just going to leave that a little while. I'm not going to use any activator because it might turn white. Uh, so I'm just going to leave it a little while for that to set. So that little crack is now gone and nice glued up nice and solidly. So I can move on with the rest of the filling now. You can see I've just gone round and circled anywhere that needs filling. So I can find it easily when I'm applying the filler. There's quite a few little bits. Uh, but while I'm on the subject of filling, you might be wondering why this guitar is such a yellow colour. And you can see it's less yellow here where it's been stripped, uh, but down in the cavities it's like really quite bright yellow. And that's because it's the grain filler which Fender used at the time, uh, called Fullerplast. They used it for a long time, I don't know when they stopped using it. Yeah, but this is actually the grain filler which they would dip the whole body in. Uh, so they'd have a big vat of it and then they'd dip the body in, and that would fill all the grain and give them a good base to spray onto, because uh, it would stop the wood absorbing the top coats so much. And it obviously adds this yellow tint to it as well. Uh, so they used that yellow tint for the base of the sunbursts. Um, so when, a, when you see a sunburst guitar, it's actually the fuller plast in the middle and then obviously spraying around the perimeter, the other, other colours. So we're moving on to the filling now, and I'm actually going to use two different types of filler. I'm going to use this one, which is a two-part system, which is z epoxy finishing resin. So this is an epoxy-based filler, and I use this for all my green filling normally. Uh, it does a really good job because it doesn't shrink back and it stays really stable. Now, obviously I'm not filling grain in this case, I'm filling little dents, but these little dents are about the size of grain you'd get on, say, ash or something like that. Uh, so it's just kind of the same idea and I know that will be a, do a good job and over time it won't telegraph through the finish which can happen with if you get something that shrinks back. So we know that's nice and stable. So for the edges I'm going to use a different filler uh, just because if I try and use the epoxy on these small little ones here it's going to be quite difficult to get it in there neatly without it running and just making a bigger mess anyway. Uh, so I'm going to use a two-part polyester based filler for this which is often used on cars. Um, I would use it on the top too but I just feel the epoxy does a better job and I know that's stable over a long time because I've been using it for years. So to mix this z epoxy up, I use a teaspoon and it's a one-to-one -one mix ratio. So it's a disposable teaspoon and I'll just use one teaspoon of the resin, make sure that's nice and full. And also one, the same thing, one teaspoon of hardener as well. Now I need to make sure we give this a good mix. I'm only going to use probably that much for this job because uh, the, the nicks and the little bits of damage are very small. So I'm just going to make sure this is all thoroughly mixed together. It's quite cold today, as you can see it's quite thick. Um, the hotter it is, the more runny it becomes. So I might give this a little warm with the hairdryer or heat gun just to make sure everything's fully mixed. So to apply this, I'm just going to spoon a as little as amount as I can onto the surface. Uh, these nicks have already been brushed out. I've made sure there's no dirt or anything left in them. So I've just put a little bit on the surface there and I've got a little piece of clear plastic here. Uh, this is acetate. Uh, you could use literally anything as long as it's got a square edge on it. Um, and I'm going to use that as a squeegee to force it down into there and leave as little on the surface as I can so there's not so much sanding. And I'm going to repeat this on obviously all of the other little marks on the top and the back. Uh, and then I'm going to give it 24 hours at least before I send this back. Probably a bit longer. You can see I've still got a bit there. I'm going to make sure it's fully filled before leaving it. Then I will repeat this process on all the other ones. So that's all the ones on the top done now. Uh, I'm just going to leave this to harden up and then I can send this back after at least 24 hours, maybe a bit longer. And I'm going to do the same to the back. I probably in a couple of hours time this will be dry enough to turn over so I can do the back. And then the same thing on that. So I've actually given this a second application. Uh, they weren't quite filled on the first one. Uh, so I've scraped some of the high spots off uh, using a razor. Uh, just, like, just like that. And now I'm going to follow up block sanding the whole thing with 120. And then I can move to 180 and finally 240. You don't want to sand too high of a grit because uh, it actually prevents adhesion of the lacquer or the primer in this case. Uh, so there's no point sanding to 400 or 600 or something like that. Uh, you're actually better off sanding a bit coarser. I've actually also filled the sides now as well and sanded all these flush. You can see there's only little tiny bits of filler every now and then 
and these are all nice and flush as well, so they're nice and smooth. I've actually already done the edges to 240. I might give them another going over, but they're mostly done. And I've also done the back. You can see there's the epoxy has gone into the wood a bit, uh, but that doesn't matter because it's all going to be covered in primer anyway. And But the important thing is all the little dimples, like these over here, are now flush. And because we used epoxy, they'll stay flush and not shrink back over time. That's it done up to 120 now. I'm going to follow up with 180 and then 240 finally. So it's all sanded up to 240 now and I've masked off the brass plates in here. So I'm just going to double check that although it looks good in this light I'm just going to double check that it's all good by viewing it in some different lights because when you're under big workshop lights like this it has a tendency to hide defects uh, whereas if you're in worse lighting you can actually see them a bit better sometimes which is counterintuitive but I'll demonstrate it now. So it's, it, we haven't actually missed anything, so that's good. But this is the type of thing I'm talking about, where you've got kind of a light in the back there, and then you've got it shining across the guitar. And it, if there were any defects there, they would actually stand out a lot more. So I'm just checking for any kind of imperfections in the surface, any little bits which should be filled or should be sanded out. But this is all good, so I'll check the back now. So you can see I'm kind of making the light reflect off it and moving the body around so I can try and see anything that might be there. So I'm just going to give it a dust with some air now. So it's now the following morning from when you saw me spray that primer and you can see the body's looking like it's in a bit of a state uh, but that's it's supposed to be like that it's just part of the process because uh, i've just sanded this back and that's why it looks like this i've sanded it back with 320 paper and found any little imperfections which became obvious once the primer goes on that always happens whenever you spray the primer you'll start to see little imperfections in it uh, so what we did before when we're checking in all the different lights was just like part of the process to make sure we do have as little to do at this stage as possible uh, which sort of worked. The top and the back were in really good, uh, but the sides had a lot of little nicks which weren't so obvious in. I think what had happened was the person who had stripped it originally with the original paint had used a scraper, so he had used a, like a razor blade or something like that. So there were lots of little nicks and cuts around the edge here, uh, which are very difficult to see before I had the primer on. Uh, but after I'd sprayed the primer, they kind of jumped out a bit. So you can see I've sanded those all out around the edges. So there's quite a lot of primer missing around the edges, which is now going to be sprayed back on again. Uh, so now we know we've got a perfect coat, a uh, perfect surface rather, to spray our next coat. You can see there's a couple of little ones on the back as well, which are now gone. Uh, so now we're going to spray another coat of primer, then it'll be ready for the colour coats. So it's had the second coat of primer now and everything's covered up nicely. No imperfections left at all. Uh, so we're now ready for the colour coats. Uh, but the next most important step, uh, and it's a very easy step, is to just leave it for a couple of days. If you don't do that, you can have problems later on with the paint not drying properly because you've got too much of a too much outgassing at the same time. So it's very important to leave it plenty of time to for this primer to harden up and stop outgassing. Um, minimum will be 24 hours, but I'm probably going to leave it over the weekend and come back to this on Monday. It's Friday now, uh, so I'll give it a good couple of days to dry, and then we can spray our blue onto our nice new, well prepared surface. So I'm giving the body a light sanding with 600 now, just to give it a bit of a key. Uh, so that's all ready for the colour now. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to mix our colour coats. Yeah, I've bought two different Daphne Blues ready-made. And this one seemed to be the closest. Uh, so this was by Northwest Guitars. And then the other one was Rothko & Fast. The Rothko & Fast one was a bit too bright blue. And this one is a bit more authentic to what's left on the guitar. Uh, so we're going to use this. And I'm going to... This needs thinning. So I'm going to tip it into here. And to get the mix right, it's very easy, it's just one-to-one. -one. So I'm going to tip all this in here. And then I'm just going to fill the can up again with thinner. And then mix it all up. So this is anti-bloom thinners. Uh, to help with any kind of blush problems we may have. Because over here in the UK, the weather is always a bit humid.
the herd is all mixed up now. And you can see the difference in this one and the other one I mentioned, which I also bought. And this one, next to that one, you can see it's a lot darker and a bit more vivid as well, um, which is not really what it looks like, what's left on the guitar anyway. I'm um, sure there's versions, plenty of different versions of Daphne Blue where they match because uh, the aging all has an effect as well. Uh, what's left on the neck pocket of our one is more close to this. Um, obviously that's 60 year old finish that they're uh, close to. Um, and so over time it does change. Also the clear coat will affect this. So this is actually going to get a bit greener uh, once the clear coat goes on the top because the clear coat has a kind of yellowing effect, uh, which is good because this at the moment looks a little bit too grey. Um, so the once we add the clear coat, it'll kind of give it a bit more of a turquoise colour, which is what we're looking for. So we've got about six coats on this now, and we're going to leave it there for now. Uh, but what we're going to do first is level sand it. Now you can see in the light, we've got lots of orange peel texture in this, and that's to be expected because I've been using very thick lacquer. Um, this is, I use the thick lacquer just to help it build quickly so I don't have to do so many coats. Uh, but now we're there and we've got enough coats on this. It's time to level sand this. I haven't done any level sanding beforehand because uh, I don't like to. It can introduce imperfections and impurities in the finish if you're not careful. Uh, so I don't level sand at all until I get to about this stage. Uh, so we're going to be using 400 grit on a rubber block and we're going to get this all nice and level and then once it's all level we're going to spray a couple of final coats of really thin down lacquer and because the lacquer is nice and thin it won't have any kind of this texture to it and we'll get it to flow ni out nicely and then we'll leave that, the guitar then for about a month uh, before then we can do our final level sanding at the very end with a thousand grit whereas now if I tried to le level sand this with a thousand grit I'd be here all day so it's a way of really cutting down on the wet sanding later on so we're going to be doing this level sanding dry, not wet sanding. And I'm going to use this paper here, which is really good quality stuff. And it doesn't clog at all, so I'm able to use it dry, really. I'm going to use it on a rubber block for the top here, and a smaller rubber eraser for the edges around here. So you can see this stuff really cuts fast in this area. I've just started on just now. It's basically already done, so this is not going to take long at all. So if you're wondering how you'll know when you've got a level finish, uh, it'll be when you stop seeing these little shiny dots here. So I've only passed over this area a couple of times with the sandpaper just gone like that. And you can see there's the shiny dots in there as well as the dull area where the sandpaper has touched. Uh, so once it's all been touched, it'll all be dull. Uh, so the sandpaper needs to get down to this level still on this area. And then eventually it'll look like over here where we started. Where you can see there's no shiny dots at all and it's all just dull. because It's all been avoided by the sandpaper. Now here I've just sprayed the final thin coats and you can see we've got a nice glossy surface without too much texture in it and you can see a nice reflection in there. Uh, so we're just going to leave this a month now and then we come back to it and level sand it with a thousand grit. That should be all it needs. And then we go from a thousand to fifteen hundred, two thousand and then finally buffing. So while the lacquer on the body is hardening up, I'm going to switch my attention to the neck. Uh, so here's what it looks like at the moment. I've just taken the nut out. That knocked out easily enough. Scored either side just in case, but it wasn't necessary because it hadn't been lacquered over like they do with Gibson nuts. Yeah, but you can see these frets have a little bit of wear to them. So we're going to level those up. And we're also going to clean up the fretboard and get the frets all nice and shiny and ready for the next 60 years. So I've got them leveled and ground now, and you can see all the fret wears now disappeared. Uh, so I'm just in the process of polishing them up now. Uh, I've already done 400, I'm going to go through 600, 800, 1000, and then I'll go on to buffing them, and then we can clean the fretboard up also. 
these are all nice and shiny now and now i need to give the fretboard a good clean it's got some quite thick layers of dirt on there so i'm actually going to use a razor blade but make sure i don't take any of the wood off i'm just going to be using it on the dirt just to scrape it like just like that and that's just taking off the dirt and not the wood yeah so i'll do that and then follow up with some steel wool uh, to get it a nice polish and then we can oil it so here it is all nice and clean now uh, so i'm just going to put the oil on now i'm going to be using bore oil uh, which is like an oil they use on woodwind instruments and it works nicely for fretboards uh, if it was one of my own builds i'd probably put something like danish oil or something like that for the initial coat uh, but this board is very old already and i don't want to introduce anything non-original and bore oil doesn't harden or dry like uh, danish oil does for example so it's not altering it in any way it's just sealing it a bit so i've just applied a very thin coat of the oil now i'm just going to leave it about 10 minutes and then i'm going to wipe all the excess off i can see this fretboard is really nice this is brazilian rosewood not like you'll get these days or for quite a long long time now it's a it's a bit of a special one of course back then in the 60s it didn't mean anything to them because the wood wasn't so endangered and it was still being used a lot uh, but now this fretboard would be a lot of money if you're going to buy it new and here's the neck all done now with the nut back in place all the frets nice and level and the fretboard oil so it's been about a month now and the finish has hardened nicely um, so i've already been doing the wet sanding and you can see i've got all the back done now see this is all nice and dull um, that's because it's all been sanded and you can see there's no shiny spots on there and then we'll have a look at the front now which hasn't been done and you can see there's still got the spray texture there and once i sand this you'll see these little tiny dots um it'll be very small because the texture is actually very fine uh, but they need to all come out uh, so i'll just demonstrate now uh, if you'd like to see this process in more detail i do have another video up which you can have a look at uh, i'll show you just a brief section on this so i'm just going to concentrate on this area here I'll put the light on a bit more. You can see the kind of texture in there. It's actually very fine. It's, it looks worse than it is. Uh, so I can level this with a thousand bit paper on a rubber block. Uh, it's just a case of sanding it for a short while and wiping off the water and seeing the process progress further. So that won't be enough, I don't think, yet, but I'll show you what we're looking for. You can see these shiny areas here with little specks in that's that's why we haven't gone deep enough yet we have to keep sanding and the dull area is what we want it all to look like over here so you can see there's no shine coming off that so we want it all looking like that and then when it's like that we can progress through the grits yeah so it'll be 1500 or 1200 then 1500 then 2000 and then i'll be ready for buffing so now i've gone through the grits with the wet sanding and we're at this point here uh, and you can see i've just started buffing as well uh, I do have a pedestal buffer, but it's not often running at the moment. And I actually find sometimes prefer to use one of these instead, which is just a cheap dual action polisher like they use on cars. And I find this works out really well. And it's a lot, lot better than doing it by hand. So I've just applied a thin layer of compound to this. And, I, and for this one, I'm using the super heavy Menzerna, uh, number 300. And I'm just gonna move this buffer diagonally across, backwards and forwards across the guitar body. And then we just wipe off whatever's left. And it's important not to overdo the buffing, as in uh, not to press down too hard on the machine or use too fast of a setting on it. I've got it set to about three out of five. And if you get with good, the high settings, you can actually get kind of little popping coming through the finish, like they call it solvent pop. Uh, it shouldn't happen, but it can happen. Uh, and it'll leave big craters in your finish as it kind of burns from the inside. So basically you're just getting the finish too hot and you don't want to do that. But you can see that's this is the second pass with the polisher and we're pretty much there. There's a few little scratches which I can come back to now. I bet you can see we've got a lovely glossy surface. So yeah, there's the workshop reflecting in there. So I'm going to give it another pass now just to get the final little scratches which you can only see in certain light. You probably won't be able to see on the camera. Maybe you will. You can see them in the light there. They need to come out. And if at any point you get something that looks a bit more major, 
air than buffing wood take out, you can go back to wet sanding or even micro mesh, which I sometimes use, which can be good to kind of intermediate your grades. So now you can see there's no scratches left. See the light shining in it? You would normally see kind of scratches around that. There's nothing there, it's nice and flat and shiny. A few bits of buffing compound still left on here, but they need to come off. That just wipes off. And I've also done the front as well. You can see that's shining nicely as well. So I'm going to go through a finer compound now just to get even more shine out of it. And then we can start assembling it. So I've done the next level of buffing and it's all looking great. So it's time now to assemble the guitar. Uh, so this is just a little trick I like to do for installing uh, these bushings uh, for the bridge. I also do this for tunematic bushings and anything else that needs pressing in really. It's much better than hammering. Uh, so I use the pillar drill or drill press and then I get that aligned in there, the bushing. And then I just use the pillar drill to push down on that. And you can see that does it nice and easily. There we go. I've already done the other one. Yeah, I've also got some copper tape just here, which is to create the bridge ground. I've got a wire in there, but rather than having a wire on the top uh, touching the bridge, which could, would then dent the finish under the bridge, I've decided to use a bit of copper tape on the top here and then a wire inside the cavity. And that wire runs from there to the copper pl uh, brass plate here. Uh, so that's how I ground the bridge. So we can check our continuity if we want to be sure, to make sure that that's, everything's making contact as it should, that bridge ground I just mentioned. So I've just put the bridge in place now, and you can see that beep means it's got a link between the two. And you can see the wire just exits here on this copper foil. And then this should link also to this as well, because uh, this is all linked together. And then this wire here will be connected to the control plate, which will take everything to ground. So it's got a bridge back on now. Uh, you'll also notice I've countersunk every one of these pit guard holes. And I also did the bridge holes as well before the screws went through them. And same for these ones, the strap buttons, and even the back, the holes of these on the back. Uh, that's to stop the lack of cracking as the screw goes through it. Because if you don't countersink them and you just leave it as it was after spraying, as the screw goes through, you'll get cracks which come off these holes. And they can be quite small or they can be quite big. Um, so you obviously don't want to take any chances and it's much nicer to keep everything neat anyway. So I've just countersunk each one, and I used an ordinary bit like that to do it, uh, except I've used a blowtorch on it to heat it up, uh, and that way it stops it chipping when you countersink it. If you try to use this cold, it will chip just as if you would, just as if it would if you had put the screw through it. Uh, so it's important to heat it up, uh, and that way you don't get any chipping. So I've now got the pit guard mounted, and I'm just going to reinstall the strap buttons now. Uh, whenever I put strap buttons on a guitar, I like to make sure I use the felt washers. Uh, these protect the finish, because if you screw this into a fresh nitro finish, uh, the metal base of the strap button could easily crack it. And here it is now with the strings on. So I've gone for an 11 gauge set of strings. Uh, partly because this is a shorter scale, and so the 11s on it will feel more like 10s on a normal scale guitar. And also partly because the neck had an ever so slight back bow in it without string tension. So the 11s on it has actually pulled it into the necessary amount of relief, which is about you know, 8 thousandths of an inch. So it's playing perfectly now. And also the 11s worked really well with the trim as well. Uh, so this is, now it's got strings on for, for the first time in at least 20-something uh, years, because that was when the guy bought it and hadn't strung it up since. Yeah, so it's nice to finally get some strings on it and it can make music again. Now here's a quick look at the back. So you can see we've got a really nice gloss on that and it's dead flat as well. There's no kind of drops in it or anything like that. Any little dimples or orange peel or anything like that. Really nice flat surface. And the neck, as you know, has not been touched finish wise. This is just all the original finish on here. And that's playing nicely and feeling just as it should. So, good for another 60 years now.
that's all for this one. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, if you have, please do leave me a like and make sure you subscribe to see more content like this. Uh, thanks again for watching and I'll see you on the next one.